Hello, this is another tale from A Book of Magic Animals by Ruth Manning Sanders, and this is the seventh tale in the book, entitled The Dolphin, which is a story from Wilka. Once upon a time there lived a fisherman and his wife, who were sorely grieved because they had no children. So the fisherman went to consult a wizard, and the wizard said, In the depths of the ocean there swims the fish deep under. If you catch this fish and cook it, and if your wife eats of its liver, she will bear a child. The fisherman had never heard of the fish deep under, but he set out in search of it. He sailed over seven seas. He cast his net in deep waters and in shallow waters. In the daytime, in the night time, in calm and in storm, he caught fishes big and fishes little, but he never caught deep under. And to everyone he met on his journeyings, he put the same question. Can you tell me where deep under is to be found? And from everyone he got the same answer. You're wasting your life. Go home. Neither hook nor neck can reach so deep as the depths where deep under swims. So, at last, sick at heart, the fisherman turned his boat and set sail for home. And there came a dolphin swimming round the boat. And the dolphin said, Fisherman, fisherman, why so sad? The fisherman told him. And the dolphin said, eh, I am the king of the dolphins, and I can help you. I know where the fish deep under lurks, and I can bring it to you. Eh, but in return, you must make me a promise. If, having eaten of deep under's liver, your wife should bear a son, give me your promise that I may be the child's godfather. That I gladly promise said the fisherman. The dolphin said, eh, they wait for me in yonder little cove. And he swam swiftly away. The fisherman steered his boat into the little cove, let down his anchor and waited. He waited one day. He waited two days. He waited three days, but never did a sight he get of the dolphin. Bah! That creature was fooling me, he would say. I'm off home. And he pulled up the anchor and was running up his sail when there came a flurry of waves. And there was the dolphin bounding through the water faster than fast, with a little golden fish in his mouth. Eh, here is the Anna, said the dolphin, tossing the little golden fish into the boat. Eh, I have kept my word. Do you keep yours, fisherman? Call me on the day of the christening. Then the dolphin swam away, and the fisherman sailed home, with the little golden fish deep under. Well, his wife cooked and ate that little golden fish, and what do you think? By and by she gave birth not only to one baby, but to a couple, a boy and a girl, as handsome a little pair of twins as you could find should you search the world over. The parents decided to call the girl Anna and the boy Peter. And now came the question of the christening. Among the fisher folk there were plenty who were willing to stand godparents. But our fisherman, mindful of his promise to the dolphin, declared that the christening must take place on the sea beach, and for that the priest was not very willing. However, it was that or nothing with the fisherman, so the priest had to agree. The christening party went down to the beach, and there was the dolphin waiting. The dolphin said and did all that was required of him, as well as any human godfather could have done. And before going back into the water, he said to the fisherman, eh, When your son is grown up, if he ever needs help, let him row out to sea and call me. Well, the twins, Peter and Anna, grew and flourished. They were handsome, they were happy, they were strong and good. They rejoiced the hearts of their parents. Anna worked about the cottage and garden with their mother, Peter went fishing with their father, and often as they sailed the deep waters the fisherman would talk to Peter of his dolphin godfather, 
and Peter would cast an eye over the sunlit or the starlit or the moonlit waters, hoping for a sight of that godfather. But never a sight did he get. So life passed pleasantly for many years. But alas, when the twins were but scarce grown up, a fever struck their village, and both their parents caught the fever and died. Then Peter must go to sea alone to earn a livelihood for himself, and Anna, who cooked and cared for him, and washed and mended his clothes in loving and sisterly fashion. Now, on a hill above the fishing village stood the king's summer palace. The king was a widower, and had an only daughter, the princess Nina, young, beautiful, and good. There were suitors and more suitors, princes, dukes and lords, arriving every day at the palace with their gifts and proposals for the hand of Princess Nina. But the king thought none of them good enough. He had made up his mind that Nina was to marry the Emperor of the East, and he got tired of being pestered by all these other suitors. So what did he do? He went sailing in the royal yacht, and in the middle of the great bay, he took off his ruby ring and threw it into the deep water. Then he went back to the palace and sent out heralds. Oye, oye, oye! Somewhere in the waters of the great bay, His Majesty the King has lost his ruby ring. Whosoever can find the ring and restore it to His Majesty within seven days from this day, shall have the Princess Nina to his wife and become heir to the throne. But whoever tries to find the ring and fails shall come no more within the queen, king's presence, or pain of death. And so he get rid of these tiresome suitors, thought the king with a chuckle. For, of course, they will all go seeking for the ring, and of course none of them will find it. Well, you may be sure that for the next seven days the great bay was crowded with all manner of boats, big and little, and all manner of men, young and old, rich and poor, were stripping off their clothes and diving down into the water and coming up empty-handed, and going down again, and yet again. Whilst in the palace on the hill the king was sitting on a balcony watching the scene through a telescope and chuckling. But the lovely Princess Nina ran to hide herself in her room, and there she drew the curtains across the window and sat on her bed and wept. She thought her father was making a fool of her, and though he had told her about the Emperor of the East, that didn't comfort her. She didn't want to marry any tiresome old Emperor whom she had never set eyes on. She knew well enough whom she would like to marry, and that was the young fisherman Peter whom she sometimes met when he brought a, hand, a basket full of fish up to the palace, and who was strong and handsome, and who smiled so charmingly, and who walked as if he owned the world. But of course she couldn't tell the king, nor anyone else, about Peter. And so whilst the suitors dived, and the king, sitting on the palace balcony with a telescope to his eye, watched and chuckled, Poor young Princess Nina hid herself in her room and wept. And what was our young fisherman Peter doing? Well, he was diving with the rest, for now it seemed that he had as good a chance of winning the princess as any prince or lord or duke among them all. So one day passed, and another day passed, and still the great bay was crowded with boats big and little, and still from dawn to dusk, yes, and even by starlight, the divers were going down, coming up with nothing better than a handful of sand or a pebble or two. But after the third day, many gave up the search and sailed away, cursing the king for having made fools of them. And when the seventh day dawned, none were left seeking but the local fishing lads, and even these at that seventh day wore on, towards sunset, hoisted their sails and returned to harbour. Now, the sun, lowering in the west, sent a glittering pathway across the quiet water, and in the stern of the boat stood fisherman Peter, silhouetted against the sun, cupping his hands to his mouth and calling loud, Godfather! Godfather Dolphin! See, on that instant there comes the dolphin, rushing through the waters. Eh, eh, Godson, what do you wish? 
Oh, Godfather Dolphin, I would wish help in finding the King's Ruby Ring. Eh, Godson, in a little minute, or in a long minute, I will find it. Down dives the dolphin. Up he comes again. Has he found the ring? No, he hasn't. He swims here, he swims there, he takes breath. Down he goes again in another place. Up he comes again. No ring yet. And the sun, a great red ball, rests on the horizon. The seventh day will soon be gone, and all Peter's hopes gone with it. What is Dolphin doing? He is resting on the water. He seems to be listening. Can he hear the ring calling? Who knows? But suddenly he swings round with a mighty splash, dives in another place, comes up, and in his mouth, see the ring. Eh, catch! The ring, a tiny red flame, flashes from Godfather Dolphin to Godson Peter. Eh, now be off with you, Godson Peter, for you have no time to waste. But when you next need me, don't wait so long before you call. For if you call, I come. If you do not call, how should I come? Then, even whilst Peter was blurting out his thanks, the dolphin spun away, and Peter rode home. Anna, Sister Anna, I have the King's ruby ring. Bring me a clean shirt, bring me my Sunday suit, bring me one of your roses to wear in my buttonhole. Oh, and Harry, 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 I must to the palace before nightfall. Oh, dearest Sister Anna, I feel my heart will burst with joy. Sister Anna hurried to fetch Peter his clean shirt and his Sunday suit. She cut a red rose and put it in his buttonhole, but she was not smiling. Peter, dearest Peter, hope little and expect less. The king is evil and hard of heart. Anna, dearest sister, now unless I hope much and expect all, my heart will break. And so, dressed in his Sunday suit, with a red rose in his buttonhole and carrying the king's ruby wrapped in a clean handkerchief, Peter hurries to the palace, tells his errand, and is brought into the king's presence. Your Majesty, I have brought you back your ruby ring. Fisherman, I don't believe you. Let me see it. Bah! It must be a fake. Where was it found? On the sea bottom, Your Majesty. How could I, a simple fisherman, contrive to fake such a ring as this? Yes, yes, you, a fisherman. That's the point. Well, I will grant you that the ring is genuine, and your reward shall be a sack full of gold. For you must see for yourself that it is impossible that you, a fisherman, should inherit the kingdom. It is impossible that you, a fisherman, should marry my daughter. She herself would not hear of it. If the princess might be asked about that, Your Majesty. No! She shall not be asked. The king flew into a temper, stamped, and began to shout. How dare you suggest such a thing? Be off, you ragamuffin! Get out of my sight! Don't you dare approach me again until you come with a chest full to the brim with pearls and diamonds. And that will be never, never, never. Peter walked off with his head held high. He went down to the harbour. He stood on the edge of the starlit water. He cupped his hands before his mouth and called loud, loud, Godfather Dolphin! And on the instant there came the dolphin, rushing through the star street water. <coughs> Godson, what do you wish? Godfather Dolphin, the king has broken his word. It is not enough that I return his ruby ring. Now I must bring him a chest fill, full to the brim with pearls and diamonds. Godson, you shall carry him such a chest. At daybreak tomorrow you will see in the great bay a small green boat far out and gently rocking. <coughs> Row to that little boat, tow it ashore, and take what is in it. And so, Godson Peter, until we meet again, all good go with you. And with you, Godfather Dolphin. The dolphin swam away. Peter went home. Before dawn next morning he was up and looking out over the great bay. Yes, there was a little green boat far out and gently rocking. P 
Peter took a tow line, ran his own boat down into the water, jumped in and rowed to the little green boat. In the little green boat was a big chest of oak wood. Peter towed the green boat ashore and lifted out the chest. My word, but that chest was heavy. Peter could scarcely drag it home. And when he did get it home and lifted the lid, what did he see inside? Heap upon heap of sparkling diamonds, heap upon heap of shimmering pearls. Oh, that faithless king, what will you make of this lot? For now here comes Peter again, a rope over either shoulder, toiling up the hill to the palace and dragging the oakwood chest on a handcart behind him. The king, having breakfasted, is sunning himself on the terrace. When he sees Peter, he leaps up, shouting and stamping with rage. But Peter sets the chest before him, loosens the ropes, lifts the lid. Aha! The diamonds sparkle, the pearls shimmer. The king plunges both hands into the chest. He would almost wish the jewels to be fakes that he might get rid of Peter. But his greed exults to know that they are real. Rog, where did you get them? I found them in the Great Bay, Your Majesty. You lie, you lie, you are a thief. You would swindle me with stolen goods. You deserve to be hanged, sir. Yes, hanged. And if I spare your life, it is only that I am merciful by nature. But you shall do no more thieving. King calls his guards. Peter is marched away to prison and in a great fortress that stands on a rock jutting out into the sea. <coughs> the king has the chest carried into his treasury and spends the morning gloating over the gleaming jewels. But what now? Here is Peter's sister Anna at the palace door, clamouring to be let in, clamouring to see the king and say her say in defence of Peter. But no! The king will not see her. She had better take herself off, or she will find herself in prison also. What? She won't go. Put her outside the gates. Take a whip to her if needs be. There goes Anna, down the hill again, weeping bitter tears. And weeping she comes to the fortress prison on its rock above the sea. She calls, calls, Peter, Peter, oh my brother, my brother Peter. But the fortress walls are thick and he does not hear her. She flings herself down there on the rock and weeps till dawn. And then the dawn with the high tide comes the dolphin. Eh, dear kind loving Anna, why do you weep? I weep because the king has shut Peter up in prison behind seven iron doors. Oh, good dolphin, if you could but rescue Peter and win his princess for him. I would give you all the little I possess. Eh, would you give me yourself, Anne, to be my wife? Yes, gladly, gladly. Eh, Anna, I will set Peter free. Under the fortress there are deep sea caves, and the king's guards know nothing of them. Through those caves I will bring Peter out. Eh, now, dry your eyes, go home, put on your house into order. And prepare yourself for a long voyage. Tomorrow morning, when the tide is high, go down to the harbour. There you will find the princess. And what the princess asks you to do, that you must do. Goodbye till tomorrow, Anna. Till tomorrow, Peter's godfather. The dolphin swam away. Anna walked home. She set the house in order, tidied up the garden, made two small bundles of her own clothes and Peter's clothes, got through the day and the night somehow. And on the morrow's dawn, there she was, down in the harbour. The tide was full. Peter's little boat, ro boat rocked gently in the shallows. And in the boat, who should be sitting, elbow on knee, head in hand, but Princess Nina. And Princess Nina lifted her eyes to Anna and said, Peter's sister, will you row me out into the bay for a little while? My heart is sorrowful and my head aches, and on the land I cannot rest. Surely I will row you out, my princess. So Anna jumped into the boat, pulled up the anchor, took the oars, and rowed Princess Nina out into the still waters of the bay. And by and by Princess Nina leaned towards Anna and said, Peter's sister, 
now we are alone, quite, quite alone, where no one can hear us. I have something to tell you. I love your brother Peter. Oh, how dearly I love him. And now he is in prison, and for my sake, and my heart is breaking. If we cannot rescue him, I shall surely die. Anna looked all over the calm water. Princess, we have no need to rescue him. See there, over there. Now the sun, risen behind the castle hill, threw a pathway of glittering gold across the still water. And in the golden pathway, the dolphin was swimming, carrying Peter on his back. And now Peter was in the boat, and one moment Anna was in his arms, and the next moment he was on his knees at the feet of the princess. Fisherman Peter, it was you who found my father's ring. Yes, my princess. Then, Fisherman Peter, why do you not claim your reward? Oh, my princess. Yes, your princess Peter, now and forever. But the dolphin was beating the water with his tail. <laughs> come, come, this is no time for dallying. Hoist the sail, godson Peter. The wind is scant enough, and we have a long way to go. Where are we going, godfather dolphin? Eh, across the sea. There is to there to live free. Now follow me. So Peter hoisted the sail and took the helm, and the dolphin swam ahead, leading the way. All day they sailed, sailed south by west, came at evening to the shore of a new country, and landed at the quay of a small fishing town, where the people were friendly and welcomed them with few questions asked. In that town, as soon as might be, Peter and the princess were married, and after the wedding the dolphin gave Peter a small bag of pearls and said, <coughs> God son Peter, go sell these pearls and buy yourself a cottage and any fishing gear you need, that you may earn a living for your wife and yourself. As for me and my bride, we must go to my kingdom under the sea. Then the dolphin took Anna on his back, and set off to swim to his own kingdom. And Peter and the princess stood on the sea beach, and waved to them until they were out of sight. For seven days and seven nights the dolphin swam over the deep sea with Anna on his back, and came at last to the entrance of a cave on a great island. Then the dolphin said, <coughs> Anna, my wife, under this island lies my kingdom. What would it please you to do? Will you live in your maiden shape on the island, or will you take dolphin shape and swim down with me into my kingdom? Anna said, I will be as you are, my husband. Then the dolphin gave a great heave of his back and tossed Anna high into the air. Whoosh! Up she went, splish, splash, down she fell into the sea, and as she touched the water, there she was, no maiden any more but a dolphin. And merrily, merrily the two, dolph two dolphins dived down into the cave and swam out through the cave into the depths of ocean. Now dark, and ever darker grew the depths they swam through. And now Dolphin Anna could see nothing and must be guided only by her husband Dolphin's voice, until away in the distance glimmered a little gleam of light. And as they swam towards that shimmer of light, it grew brighter and brighter and bigger and bigger. Now it was not one light, but many lights, lamps innumerable, golden, glowing, lighting up a great city whose inhabitants, big and little, came swimming out to meet the two dolphins, hailing them as king and queen. So, amidst the hubbub of cheering and splashing and echoing voices, King Dolphin and Queen Anna were escorted by their rejoicing subjects to the royal palace, and Queen Anna said, If all now goes well with my brother Peter, the world can hold no happier soul than I. Now, you will remember that at parting the dolphin had given Peter a little bag of pearls and told him to sell them. Well, Peter did that, and with the money he got for them he bought a cottage close to the harbour, and also nets and lines and all the fishing gear he needed. Every day now he put out to sea with the other fishermen and did well enough, though he might have done better if Princess Nina had had 
any ideas about how to skip them. But she hadn't. She couldn't resist buying pretty things when she saw them, and so some of their money was wasted on useless trifles. But, bless me, what did that matter to either of them? They had enough to eat, and they loved each other, and what more did either of them want? If only, oh, if only they could have been left in peace. But, far away across the sea, in his palace on the hill, the king, Princess Nina's father, was flying into one rage after another, sending out ships all over the world to search for the princess. The ships were laden with pretty and costly goods, and the crews had order to trade as merchants in any country they might reach, and never to cease from searching until they found the princess. For the ship's crew who found her and brought her home, there awaited a big reward. For the ship's crews who returned before she was found, there awaited their gallows. So at last it happened that one of these ships came into the harbour of the very fishing town where Peter and Princess Nina were living. And the captain and the first mate strolled into Keyside Tavern to glean what news they might. In the tavern they met two fishermen. And then it was drinks all round, and what news, my lads? And they soon learned all about Peter and his beautiful wife, who was such a careless housekeeper and so fond of pretty things. The captain winked at the first mate, and the first mate winked at the captain. The captain said, The lady sounds like a customer for us. We are merchants who deal in pretty things. Now, my lads, there are three pieces of gold waiting for all or any of you who will bring the lady on board our vessel that she may see our goods. What our fisherman husband might object, then wait until he's out at sea and then bring her. Is that a bargain? Oh, yes, to be sure it's a bargain. Since three pieces of gold don't come so pat into a man's hand every day. So, next morning, after Peter has set out for the fishing grounds and Princess Nina has watched his little boat until it disappears around the cliffs beyond the town and has then gone back into the cottage and shut the door, had that somebody comes knocking and she opens the door again. What? Fisherman Tom and Dick not at sea yet? My Peter has been gone this half hour. What do you say? We are messengers from two merchants who have pretty things to sell. You think I would like to see them? Well, so I would. But as to buying, I don't know. But there it costs nothing to look. Yes, I'll come with you. And she goes. The captain receives her with bows and smiles. He leads her down into the cabin where all the pretty things, coloured silks and satins and jewelled ornaments, are laid out for her to see. Meanwhile, Tom and Dick have each been given their three pieces of gold and gone. And after that? Well, after that, it's up anchor and put to sea, my lads, as quickly and quietly as may be. And the princess, absorbed in all the pretty trifles the captain is showing her, notices nothing until the ship begins to heave under her feet. What's this? She flings down the jewelled comb she is trying in her hair, runs up on deck and sees the shore, the town, the harbour, her own cottage drawing away every minute further and further away, rushes down to the cabin again. Captain, what is the meaning of this? Take me back to the land at once. Your royal highness, it grieves me. Well, I have to disobey you, but we have come by the order of the king, your father, to bring you home. Home, my home is here, in that little white cottage near the harbour wall. Oh, Captain, have pity. Take me back. I have never done you any harm. Why must you break my heart? Think of my poor husband. Oh, me, what will become of him? Take me back. Take me back. Oh, no good. Orders are orders and must be obeyed, so the captain tells her. And when she tries to throw herself overboard, then the captain, very regretfully, very politely, ties her hands together and her feet together and lays her on cushions on the cabin floor. So when Peter came home that evening, he found the cottage empty. Where could Nina be? It wasn't like her not to be waiting to greet him. 
He strolled into the town, seeking her, not finding her. He began to feel anxious. Has anyone seen my wife? Yes, a woman had seen her in the morning going down to the harbour with two fishermen. What two fishermen? Well, Dick and Tom, where are they now? Well, in the tavern. So to the tavern runs Peter and finds Tom and Dick in merry mood, having parted with one of their gold coins. What have you done with my wife? Done with her? We ain't done nothing with her, nor to her. We took her down to the ship to see some wares. What ship? The big trading ship in the harbour. There is no big trading ship in the harbour. Well, then, he must have gone. Ah, me, yes, he must have gone. Peter went back to his empty cottage and wept. And far away in his kingdom under the sea, the king dolphin said to his dolphin wife, Anna, eh, I have a feeling that all is not right with my godson, your brother Peter. At the moment I cannot leave my kingdom, so you had better go and visit him. Dolphin Anna set off swimming. She swam for seven days and seven nights, and came to the fishing town and found Peter lying face downward on the sand. Peter! Brother Peter! No answer. Dolphin Anna poked him with her nose and flapped him with her flippers, and Peter shrugged up one shoulder and said, Leave me alone! But Dolphin Anna wouldn't leave him alone. She kept poking him. Brother Peter, tell me, only tell me, what is the matter? Have you and Nina quarrelled? Peter sat up then and he looked wild. Ha ha, he cried. If we could but quarrel. But the king has sent a ship. They have taken her away. I shall never see her again. Never, never. And now I shall die. But Dolphin Anna said, For shame. I will return to my Dolphin King, your godfather. He will tell us what to do. Keep up your heart. We will get Nina back. And she went down into the sea and swam away and came after seven days and seven nights to the Dolphin Kingdom and told King Dolphin all that had happened. The King Dolphin said, eh, This is a bad affair. In order to win back Peter's wife, my Anna, I must turn you once more into a human maiden. But if I do that, will you ever come back to me? And Anna answered, Of course I will come back to you, my husband. This is now my life, and I would not change it for all the world and they swam up through the cave together. And King Dolphin seized Dolphin Anna in his mouth and flung her high into the air. Whoosh! Up she went, splish, splash, down she fell. She went up a dolphin, and she came down a maiden. And King Dolphin took her on his back and swam for seven days and seven nights, and came to where Peter paced the shore under his cottage in a frenzy of impatience and grief. Eh, Godson, said King Dolphin, I fear you are neither calm nor sensible. Godfather, said Peter, how can I be calm? How can I be sensible, dying here and doing nothing? Set me but doing something, and I will be as calm as Anna here, and sensible as yourself. <coughs> then, godson, said the dolphin, run your boat down into the sea, and row out with Anna to the place that I shall show you. So Peter launched his boat. And he and Anna got into her, and Peter took the oars, and the dolphins swam ahead, leading them along the coast and into a cove that Peter had never seen before. And in that cove was anchored the most beautiful white ship that anyone ever saw, with silver sails and gold masts and rigging and a crew of smart lads in green jackets piped with silver. At sight of Peter, the crew raised a loud cheer and a company of elegantly dressed lords and ladies came to lean over the rails and join in the cheering. Eh, this is your ship, godson Peter, said the dolphin, and in it you will sail to your old home where the king now holds your wife, the princess Nina, a prisoner. But the rescuing of the princess is your sister Anna's affair, not yours, and what she, shall, she tells you to do, that you must do. Now, get aboard your ship and be off. Then the dolphin swam away, and Peter and Anna went aboard the white ship. A troop of ladies in waiting led Anna below and clothed her in silk and velvet and set jewels in her hair and diamonds about her throat. And when they had done with her, she came laughing to Peter and said, Please to remember that for the time I am not your sister Anna, but the princess Anietta, an emperor's daughter. 
And so, Captain Peter, you must obey me in all things. And Peter laughed and said, At your orders, my princess. And so they sailed to the land where they were born. And when they came in sight of the king's palace on the hill, Hannah said, Now, Captain Peter, get you below and stay below until I bring your wife to you. And whether that will be a short time or a long time, I cannot tell. So Peter went down below, and the first mate steered the white ship into the harbour, and Anna disembarked, followed by a train of lords and ladies, and was carried up in a litter to the king's palace, where she had herself announced as Princess Anietta, the daughter of the Emperor of the Seven Kingdoms, and now on her travels to see the world. The silly old king was delighted to receive the emperor's daughter, and he ordered the best rooms in the palace to be got ready for herself and her attendants. He also sent a message up to Nina, who was moping in her own room, ordering her to come down at once to welcome the princess Anietta. Nina came, proud and cold, but when she saw Anna she gave such a start and nearly gave the game away. And then she laughed and kissed Anna on both cheeks and said, You are welcome, Princess Anietta. The foolish king was delighted and thought, That's all Nina wants, a companion of her own age. And he said, My beautiful Princess Anietta, would it please you to stay in my kingdom for a while? And Anna answered, I will look around. If what I see pleases me, I will stay. If not, I will leave tomorrow morning. Well, it seemed that what she saw didn't please this haughty princess, because next morning she told the king that she intended to travel home. But first she invited the king and Princess Nina to visit her ship. We will hold a little feast in pledge of our goodwill, she said, for it is right that we should part as friends. Well, well. The king was disappointed that she was going so soon, but he was delighted to visit the ship. He was shown all over it by the first mate, the captain being indisposed and confined to his cabin, strictly by my orders, explained Princess Anietta. And this was true enough, because she had actually locked Peter up in his cabin, lest he give the game away, by rushing to embrace his wife. Fortunately, the king was too busy admiring the beautiful little ship to bother about the captain. And as to the feast, the delicious foods and the rare wines. Well, by the time all that was swallowed down, the king was in no mood to think of anything but the charms of his hostess. He even found himself proposing to her, but she laughed and told him that she was already engaged. And now we must part, she said when the feast was over, and I hope we part good friends. The king said it was impossible they should part otherwise. He made a little speech. Both he and his daughter Nina, he began. Then he looked around. It seemed that Nina was no longer with them. Where was she? Did anyone know? Yes, a little page knew. The princess Nina had told him some time ago that she was going home. Going home? And we're out of word to our hostess. What manners, what terrible manners. The king couldn't apologise humbly enough to his beautiful hostess and he rode off up to his palace, determined to give Nina a good talking to. But first he called for his telescope and sat on the balcony to watch the wonderful ship hoist her silver sails and put out to sea. It was not until the ship had rounded the western arm of the Great Bay and was out of sight that the king laid aside the telescope, frowned, stalked indoors, and sent a lady-in-waiting to summon the princess and Nina. The lady-in-waiting was gone a long time. She came back at last to say that the Princess Nina was not in her room. Then find her, find her, said the king. The lady in waiting went, she had gone for a longer time. When she came back, it was to say she couldn't find the princess, nor could anyone tell her where she was. But on a table in a bedroom was a sealed letter, which had been lying there since early this morning. And this letter she now handed to the king. The king broke the seal and read, Papa, I am going home to find my dear husband, Fisherman Peter. What is done is done. You cannot undo it, so please be sensible and leave us alone. Your daughter, Nina. 
cannot undo it, indeed. He could and would. In a temper terrible to see, the king ordered out the largest of his fighting ships, got aboard and set out in pursuit. And he hadn't been long at sea before a storm blew up. Huge black clouds darkened the sky. In monstrous waves tossed the ship this way and that and flung their spoon in the king's face. Your Majesty, said the captain, there is mischief brewing. The sky becomes blacker and ever blacker. We had best turn back. Turn back? What next? The king wouldn't hear of it. Majesty, this is no ordinary storm. A devil's owl in the rigging. Indeed, indeed, we had best turn back. Cowardly fool, sail on. Majesty, the waves be ire and ire. They come against us like an army on the march. They rise against us like an host of phantoms. They shout and scream and menace us, calling, turn back. But the king still shouted, sail on. Majesty, see how the lightning flames all about us. Ark, ark, how the thunder cracks and roars. Such a storm I have never known before. If we don't turn back, we are lost. Dastad, poltroon, chicken livered milk sop. If you dare to turn back, I will have you hanged. Flash after flash of lightning, peal after peal of thunder, one moment in blinding light, the next moment in pitchy darkness and its monstrous waves, the ship was rolling, heaving, shattering, wallowing, until suddenly, with a leap like a bucking mule, she cracked in two. The king was flung in a high arc over the waves and into the sea and under the waves and felt something beneath him give a heave and raise him again to the surface. Where was he? Seated on King Dolphin's back, picking up. And, and whilst picking him up, whilst here, there and everywhere around him swing other dolphins, collecting up the drowning crew from amidst the wreckage. Now the dolphin began to speak. It was one king speaking to another. I am the king of the dolphins. Listen to me. Peter the fisherman is my godson. He brought your ring from the depths of the sea. You broke your word, denying him your daughter. You demanded a chest full of jewels. He brought you the jewels. Again you broke your word, denying him your daughter and flinging him into prison. With my help he escaped from prison and won his bride. <laughs> what next? You stole his young wife from him and came near to breaking two loving hearts. Do you now deserve that I should rescue you and carry you home? No, shivered the king. I, I can't say that I deserve it. <coughs> Yet... <laughs> I will carry you home on one condition, said the dolphin, that you will leave my godson and his wife in peace. I will leave them in peace, shivered the king. I repent me of my wicked ways. So then the dolphin swam back to land with the king, and all round him swam his subject dolphins, carrying the captain and crew of the king's ship. The rescuing of the king and the ship's company by a shoal of dolphins was a marvel that the king's people have talked of from that day to this. So now we will leave them talking and go to see how it fares with the voyages in the white ship. Certainly they met no storm on their voyage home, for the dolphins saw to it that they left the storm behind them, and they came safely into the cove where Peter had first found the white ship. Then Peter and his sister Anna and his wife the princess Nina disembarked in the white ship with its silver sails and golden rigging put to sea again. The crew of smart lads in green jackets, piped with silver, raised a cheer, and the company of elegantly dressed lords and ladies leaned over the rails and waved their handkerchiefs. And Peter and Anna and the Princess Nina waved back and watched the white ship out of sight. But to what port that white ship was now bound, they did not know, nor can I tell you. All I can tell you is that no sooner was the white ship out of sight than Peter and Princess Nina found themselves in Peter's little fishing boat, sailing home to their own cottage. Now Anna was left alone. 
She stood on the edge of the water and heard a voice calling. Eh, Anna, my wife Anna. I am waiting here for you, my husband. Eh, Anna, is it happier on the dry land or in the deep water? It is happier where you are, my husband. Eh, then come to me, Anna. Anna waded out into the sea. She waded up, out to her armpits, and there was King Dolphin swimming to meet her. King Dolphin took Anna on his back and tossed her high into the air. Whoosh, up she went. Splish, splash, down she fell into the ocean. And as she touched the water, there she was, not a woman any more, but a gentle, lustrous-eyed dolphin. And merrily, merrily, the two dolphins swam away together to their kingdom under the sea. <laughs>